So, um, of course, uh, we're already in the midst of the climate crisis. Okay, we haven't seen anything yet, but it's been ongoing already for a while, of course. It's a crisis that is visible, extremely disruptive, and very deadly. And although it's been scientifically proven for decades that the Earth is warming up, and that the cause of this is human action, we still find politicians worldwide, uh, and in the Netherlands as well, who claim that the climate crisis is not bad, or that it doesn't even exist at all. And especially you hear these voices from the extreme right. And the Netherlands will be my focus for today. We can talk about Vox in España, we can talk about uh, Modi in India, we can talk about Bolsonaro in, uh, in, in, in Brazil, because it's not only white elitist guys who are uh, propelling these ideas, but my focus, my case of study, of course, for today will be uh, the Netherlands. And before we start, I want to identify two of the main players in the field just to have everybody on the same page, because the Dutch people might know PVV and Forum for Democracy, but maybe people from uh, an international background do not. So um, for the first two minutes, I will introduce these uh, main parties, and then we will you know, dive deeper into the actual topic. Um, Geert Wilders, I guess everybody in the room has heard of him. It's the guy with the bleached Mozart hair. Well, <laughs> he was... Uh, <laughs> He was a protégé, I think it's very important to know that he was a protégé of one of the most important guys of the VVD, the Tory party, um, in, the, um, in the 90s and the, and, the, and the zeros. So in 2004, he broke away from the, for, the, 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 the VVD, the, the Tory party. And Wilder's strategy throughout the 15 or 18 years that he's been on the scene is to stretch the boundaries of public debate with provocations via Twitter and, of course, in the House of Chamber. And he always based himself on the principle of freedom of expression, whereas, you know, this uh, law is actually designed for minorities and he is using it actually against minorities. So for years, Wilders really has served as the battering ram, you know, to extend the acceptance, you know, what's acceptable within the public um, opinion. The press took him for a joke and the parliamentary left preferred to turn a blind eye. And it's very important to know that Geert Wilders has always been the one and single member of his party. In contrast, we have now the biggest party in the Netherlands, Forum for Democracy. They started in 2016, so it's in six years time, they managed to get most members of all the political parties in the Netherlands. And this, their, their project really is to build a mass-based uh, fascist party. This is Forum for Democracy, and their leader has a French name, Thierry Baudet, uh, but don't get uh, tricked by that. Um, he is a very serious uh, fascist, he's very serious about his project, um, he organizes summer camps where, you know, physical training and, and a lot of uh, debate. And so I think, yeah, very important to know that within five or six years, they grew into the biggest party of the Netherlands. Now, I want to briefly explain his ideas before we um, go into the uh, actual topic. Baudet treats the people as a kind of primordial force. It's a cultural, racial, and spiritual unity which is closely linked to its ancestors. And this is really directly, uh, you know, closely related to the Völkisch ideology which you had in the, in, the, in, the, in the 30s, the 20s, the 30s in, uh, in Germany. This Völkisch ideology means it's a kind of a mixture with national racism and conspiracy theories. So we identify uh, Forum for Democracy as a deeply fascist party because, you know, they also um, uh, relate this cultural unity of the people. Uh, they refer to a kind of myth in the past where people were heroic and it goes without saying that these people, of course, are all white and at some time, in, in, in some point in time, that there was a rupture and this rupture was caused by Jews 
or any other groups, you know, be it communists or multinationals, because according to the extreme right, we're all on the same page. So Baudet's main message is that they need a rebirth, a renaissance, to get back to this age of heroic people, you know. Um, then I want to explain two or three of their climate denying messages. So Forum for Democracy on their website says, and I translated it into in English, of course, but they say about climate, uh, uh, the climate crisis, it has not led to an increase in weather extremes such as hurricanes, tornadoes, floods or droughts. In fact, the number of victims of, related, of climate related disasters has this decreased with more than 95% over the last 100 years. And in addition, good to know, uh, the CO2 is an important nutrient for life on Earth, especially for plants and trees. The emission of CO2 therefore leads to an Earth with more trees and plants and higher agricultural yields." End of quote. Then Geert Wilders adds to this, um, he, he refers to the climate policy when I'm uh, quoting from his website. What the PVV is against is pointless unaffordable climate policy. Humans are responsible for only a couple of percentages of all CO2 in the atmosphere. It is therefore an illusion that uh, humans could significantly, significantly influence the climate. And the Netherlands are a very small country, so we're only responsible for 0.35% uh, of the total worldwide CO2 emissions. So this is neglect negligible. Now, in this talk, um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, let me just move these people there. Um, I want to briefly first explain, uh, after I, of, uh, I already explained who the PVV and for, for Democracy are, of course, but what basically is the influence of fossil fuel industry and, and their relation to capitalism. Then I also want to give a brief uh, history of uh, the climate denial from, uh, the, uh, from this industry and then tap into, you know, um, the climate denier scene in the Netherlands and its close relationship with the extreme right. And then to end, I want to touch upon briefly what fascism is according to uh, the international socialists and then of, uh, we also understand why the middle class is more receptive to these arguments. And to conclude, we will take a look at developments when climate deniers turn into climate nationalism. And uh, when they start and actually endorsing the problem and then they have their solution. So, um, to start off, um, the relationship between fossil fuels and capitalism. This relationship has been uh, brilliantly articulated by the Canadian climate activist Ian Angus, who states that fossil fuels are not an overlay that can be peeled away from capitalism, leaving the system further intact. They are actually embedded in every aspect of the system, in every industry. And it's not. Fossil fuel companies themselves, such as Shell and ExxonMobil and Total, that they have, a, of course, obviously a, uh, a heavy interest in fossil fuels, but also other uh, billion dollar industries, the plastic industries, the agro business, and so on and so forth. Also, the banking uh, uh, sector is heavily dependent on fossil industries. After the Paris Agreement in 2015, the 60 largest banks invested, and I can't even pronounce this number, it is 38,000 billion dollars. So I don't know how many zeros that is, but um, they invested such an amount of money after the Paris Agreement in fossil fuels, extracting fossil fuels from the soil. So actually we should have no uh, illusions whatsoever about the role of multinationals. And the same goes for politicians. I really want to point it out that, you know, in COP26, a couple of months ago, in November in Glasgow, it really pointed out that uh, politicians are fully incapable of coming up with proper solutions and continue their blah, 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 as Greta Thunberg so aptly stated.
Now, we come into this, um, the next topic of the large corporations uh, and their uh, idea to block cli uh, climate policy. Because we already see clearly that they have a heavy in, in interest, of course, financially, in this, uh, in this fossil fuel uh, industry and system. In the late 70s, oil and gas companies could actually not ignore the fact anymore that emissions had, uh, that they were causing um, had, had a direct relationship with uh, the warming of the earth. They did a couple of internal investigations, but the, these reports were swept under the carpet, of course, because the outcome of these reports were completely against the interests of the fossil fuel industry itself. Nevertheless, in the 80s, you had a growing global uh, public awareness, and um, so from the 80s onwards, this shifted not from you know sweeping under the carpet, but to a full-on attack on science. And how did the big business do this? Um, they created and funded a vast network of think tanks and lobbyists to sabotage any kind of proper climate policy. And also mainstream media and politicians uh, played their part um, by, by sowing confusion. And this really pushed the climate crisis into the frame of being a climate debate, whereas you have two you know, points of view. The climate alarmists, I assume that all of you in the room are climate alarmists, and then climate skeptics who are kind of denying the whole issue. And then you have like a debate, and uh, you know, in reality, it's a total distortion of scientific consensus in uh, acad academia. So now let's turn to the, um, uh, to the Netherlands. Um, this is one of the most prominent uh, speakers, but I'm going to focus on somebody else in a minute. Um, climate skeptics in the Netherlands have benefit, benefit, benefited, sorry, uh, immensely from what has already been produced in the United States. So basically what they do, they take uh, inf so called information from the United States, translate it, put it on a blog in the Netherlands or a YouTube channel or whatsoever, and then, you know, it's a very cheap way of kind of recycling information from the United States. Um, and I want to highlight, indeed, uh, one of the most prominent figures in the Dutch climate denier scene, which is Marcel Krok. And I'm highlighting him for a reason which will be a, a become apparent in, uh, in a couple of uh, uh, minutes. Um, he is a freelance uh, science journalist. He has been active for years as, you know, the bridge, so to say, between the extreme right, big business and anti-scientific uh, initiatives aimed at climate denial. Um, so what he did, he, for example, he founded this uh, climate skeptic blog, um, Climate Gate, already in 2009 with two anti-Semitic figures. And you see them here. Uh, uh, this is one of them, uh, for example, and this is the other. Um, Hajo Smit and Riepke Zeilmaker. And their anti-Semitism, I'm ex ex explicitly uh, pointing this out, because Climate Gate, this platform, welcomes anti-Semitic and pseudo-historical conspiracy theories. And since two or three years crocked together with this um, former Shell employee, Guus Berghout, um, they have been the driving force behind Clintel, which is a kind of abbreviation of uh, climate intelligence or so, and this is you know, what they are standing for. And um, this Clintel Foundation has a, a time, and a, a time and again they have meetings and they oftentimes host extreme right, sorry, they oftentimes host extreme right wing politicians as a guest speaker. So what you see here is the entwinement between, you know, extreme rights, climate denying, and it is, comes as no surprise that Kroc himself also has ties with uh, Thierry Baudet. This is Thierry Baudet, if you don't know him, uh, this uh, guy on the left in the, in the middle, so to say. Um, 
So they already know each other for uh, more than 10 years. Baudet invited Croc to come to speak at some kind of reading club. And then Croc also op uh, operated for a while as the party ideologist for the Forum for Democracy uh, for Climate Affairs. So um, there's an overlap. I think I already pointed this out, but there's an overlap between the uh, uh, lies about the climate crisis, the extreme right organizing itself, and uh, their ideology. Now let's zoom out, because I was talking about the fossil fuel industry, of course, and now, of course, also about um, the extreme right. There is a difference. I think it's very important to state. The fossil fuel uh, industry sows their lies, uh, their propaganda, with the climate skepticism uh, to protect their uh, profits. This is the one and only reason actually to sow confusion. For the extreme right, there's another reason. Um, the, uh, the climate denial is just a nice uh, idea to propel their own ideas. What they want is to mobilize the masses for their own political projects. So, you know, lies about the climate denial is a way to reach out to the middle class. So let me just briefly talk about what the middle class is, or petit bourgeoisie, or petit bourgeois in, uh, in, in English. So um, I really like the Marxist uh, explanation of this, uh, uh, what the middle class is. You have, and they're kind of located between the capitalist uh, part, uh, the, sorry, the capitalist class and the working class. They're kind of jammed in between. And they, you know, they embody all sorts of uh, small, medium-sized entrepreneurs, farmers, managers, civil servants as well. And in economic pr uh, prosperity, you know, they also benefit from, uh, from capitalism. But when it comes to a time of crisis, then they feel the pressure. The working class feels the pressure, of course, with unemployment, for example. But the middle class is not the capitalist class that has huge... Uh, uh, financial reserves that can, you know, sit their time out and uh, wait until the crisis has gone over. But it's also not the working class. The working class has their organizations, like the trade union. So, you know, the middle class, how are they going to organize themselves? So, this is exactly what the extreme right plays into. And they, you know, as long as there's no strong a uh, powerful left-wing organization or a trade union speaking properly out, then there's no uh, clear alternative to capitalism, and then the middle, you know, then the, 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 the middle class plays into the hands of the extreme right. Now I'm going to re um, uh, come back to what I already explained about Forum for Democracy, um, and what their uh, fascist ideology is all about. So. Uh, to come back to that, they present the people as some kind of racially pure, spiritual, cultural entity. Um, and this indeed uh, taps into the fears of the middle class that they're constantly threatened and are under pressure from all sides. The middle class has to deal with, in their eyes, so-called uh, expensive workers who have constantly fined for higher wages and better working conditions. Whereas, you know, powerful capitalists ruined their market with unfair competition and so on and so forth. And then, according to the far right, the middle class is also under threat from migrants and Muslims who are making their, you know, uh, neighborhoods unsafe, affect the culture of the people, etc., etc. So, um, if we take a look at the texts, which I already uh, slightly touched upon, from the Forum for Democracy and the PVV, they actually argue that climate policy is just like mass immigration and LGBTQI emancipation, part of an overarching conspiracy of cosmopolitan cultural Marxist elites. So we are in this room all part of this Marxist takeover. Um, you might have not known it yet, but uh, now you know. We want to demolish tradition, culture, and history of the Dutch people. So, and in the Netherlands, for, uh, Baudet goes as far as to state that um, 
the climate movement is kind of a watermelon. So it's actually this, this red kind of scare. It is green on the outside, but on the inside it is red. Hence the, the referral to this, uh, to this title. Now to come to some kind of a conclusion or to, no, not a conclusion yet, I'm touching upon, you know, when, when it shifts forward, right? So what I already said is that um, in the Netherlands, most of the extreme right still remain in the camp team climate denial, so to say. But if we zoom out and we take a look at the um, European context, we see this shift starting to happen. to happen. Whereas in Germany and the Alternative für Deutschland are still uh, uh, mainly uh, climate deniers, the same as a box in, uh, in the state of Spain, in the Spanish state, sorry. Um, you see that the French, uh, Marine Le Pen for example, Rassemble National, are already trying to, uh, they're starting to endorse the climate crisis as it is, but you know, uh, coming up with their own solutions. So what Marine Le Pen, this is the woman here in, on the right, uh, she's almost doing the Hitler salute, of course. Um, what she's doing, she's blame, blaming, uh, the sorry, she's blaming refugees and black people and Muslims for the climate crisis. So Le Pen claims that uh, they're dealing with nomadic people. And you see here, of course, that those nomadic people are like the French people or the Dutch people, according to Baudet, are this kind of unity, right? So it's inherently that they are like that. Um, and so um, it's them, this, it's the fault of the nomadic people and uh, they don't care about the climate. Um, so you, here you see that it gives Le Pen a justification for you know, keeping out foreign people from their own country um, because they don't take uh, care of what you know French nature is of uh, French people etc etc all right um, the last po bullet point on this uh, on this uh, uh, slide is that clo total climate denial has a shelf life eh? at a certain point you can't deny it anymore but you'll have to uh, come up with your own solutions and this is what uh, Marine Le Pen at least is already doing uh, building the walls of uh, Fortress Europe to keep uh, other people outside instead of, you know, building dikes to keep the water outside, for example. So, so to come to a sort of conclusion, and then I'll open up the floor for uh, discussion. Um, I hope it may, it, my, my talk makes, um, makes it clear that it doesn't really matter uh, to the political project of the fascists uh, of, the, of the extreme right, uh, if they recognize the climate crisis or not. Um, the far-right pro political project has always been characterized by, characterized, sorry, by a deeply racist pro-capitalist ideology that in practice will only lead to you know, uh, large-scale violence. So we have to expose and also confront fascists wherever they are. And therefore, uh, we have to also at the same time point out what the true causes of uh, the climate crisis, capitalism, which is you know, one of the uh, most uh, important words that has been uh, used already throughout the conference today. And what we have to do is we have to um, pinpoint indeed uh, that capitalism is a problem, but we also have to build a broad anti-capitalist movement um, in which you know the climate uh, uh, movement is part of, but we have to work together with people in the housing crisis uh, movement, in the anti-racist movement, in the LGBTQI uh, movements. So we really have to you know uh, join forces and uh, start fighting for a better world. So I hope this invites you to the movement, and I hope to invite you to a fruitful discussion as well. Thank you very much.